Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Tuttle, director of the Maine Women Writers Collection, and I would like to welcome you to this very exciting event, uh, Jennifer London's reading from her new book, American Breakdown. I want to welcome you all on behalf of the Women Writers Collection and our curator, Sarah Baker, as well as on behalf of the University of New England and our co-sponsor, the UNE School of Social Work, who I know will offer their own welcome in a moment. We acknowledge that although this event is virtual, we are hosting it from the present and ancestral territory of the Wabanaki people, home to the Mi'kmaq Nation, the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Passamaquoddy Tribe, and the Penobscot Nation, whose sovereignty and care for this place deserve recognition and respect. I'm so grateful to the School of Social Work for joining with us to celebrate London's new book. And I especially want to thank Jen O'Neill and Megan Webster, along with Sarah Baker, for all they did to help plan this evening. And I'd like to thank the UNE Office of Communications, especially, uh, especially Milo Grammer, Lee Cody, and Dave Diego for their indispensable work in making this Zoom meeting possible. So... Uh, I have a few words of introduction I'd like to offer for London, and then I'm going to pass it over to Jen O'Neill from the School of Social Work, who will continue that process. In February of 2001, I had been hired by UNE, but I hadn't yet moved to Maine to start my job. Uh, and I received the most delightful email from Jennifer London, who had been given my name by a UNE librarian. I have had chronic fatigue syndrome for 11 years, she explained. A few years ago, I read the Jean Strauss biography of Alice James. I identified very much with James and began to wonder about a connection between chronic fatigue syndrome and the historical disorder called neurasthenia, she went on. She then said, I envision a book exploring the connections between the two illnesses and putting their interpretations into historical, cultural, feminist context. And she described the research for this project uh, in which she was actively engaged. So that was a really exciting email to receive. Uh, and then, of course, in the ensuing 22 years, I not only had the privilege to get to know London, who quickly became a cherished friend, but I also had the honor, as have many of you, of reading the shimmering work she published over the years, which is some of the most powerful writing I have ever read. London is in a class by herself, as again, many of you know. And in American Breakdown, she delivers exactly what she described in her email to me and more, uh, a fact that impresses me greatly. Uh, it's been a joy for me to cheer her on over the years, to benefit from her advice, and to look on in admiration as she has persevered with determination and unwavering vision. And she is, as she says, quoting Alice James, an indestructible quantity. <laughs> At the Maine Women Writers Collection, we, we collect, preserve, provide, and celebrate the work of authors and creators whose identities overlap with the gendered category of woman and who have some connection to Maine or to the Dawnland more generally. And as such, we're thrilled to help welcome London's book to the world. So I have some information about London. It's just a snippet because there's so much more to say. But uh, her nonfiction has been published in Creative Nonfiction, Orion, River Teeth, Diagram, many other journals and anthologies, and has been recognized with a Pushcart Prize and named as notable in Best American Essays. A collection of her poetry won the University of New England's Blue Stocking Award in 2002. Her paper about the health impacts of industrialism was selected through rigorous peer review for an anthology on writer Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And she's the recipient of multiple grants, a Breadloaf Rona Jaffe Foundation scholarship in nonfiction, fellowships from several artist residencies, including Yaddo, Hedgebrook, Hugh Oaks Artist Colony, and the Dora Mar House in the south of France, among others. And among other honors, in 2019, she was named the winner of the Maine Artist Fellowship in Literary Arts. 
And in 2020, her essay, Fugitive Justice, won the main literary award for short works in nonfiction. So there's much more I could say about her achievements and accolades, but I'd like to pass it on now here to Jen O'Neill. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jennifer O'Neill. I am the director of the School of Social Work for the University of New England. Um, London is a graduate of the School of Social Work. She graduated in 2002. Um, she has a bachelor's in English from the University of Southern Maine as well. Uh, in 2016, I began teaching as an adjunct for Simmons, which is uh, how I met London. We were both in our faculty orientation. It was a newer program. And I had said in response to a question to London, you know, reach out to me if you need any help. I've done some online teaching. And she did. And thus began a many, many year friendship. Uh, and then uh, the, a year later, I became the director of the online program for UNE. So I reached out to London and said, now that you have all this experience, do you want to come teach for us? And she did for quite a few years before she stopped to really focus on finishing up this, this work of art that she's created. Um, so I have some more social worky things to say about London. Um, and so London worked as a therapist per diem in several agencies in between 2002 and 2008, when she entered private practice as an LCSW and a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. In 2011, she opened the Center for Creative Healing, a small state licensed agency without walls, where she was the director and clinical supervisor, in addition to maintaining her own caseload. Um, in 2012, the main chapter of the National Association of Social Workers named her main social worker of the year for legislative advocacy and grassroots organizing to maintain health insurance access for low income and disabled Mainers. In 2013, she worked with Maine's chapter of the NASW to pass a bill to extend the statute of limitations in cases where therapists sexually abuse their clients. So she's done some incredibly important work for the people of Maine. In 2017, she closed her agency and left her private practice to focus on writing American Breakdown, offering clinical supervision and teaching graduate level social work online, first for Simmons and then for us. Um, when she got her book deal, however, she set aside teaching to work full time on American Breakdown. She continues to offer online individual and group supervision. Um, a little bit about how tonight will run. So uh, after I wrap up my remarks, London will read uh, from her book and talk about some of the uh, passages that she's going to be reading from. And then Jennifer Tuttle and I will enter into our conversation. You will notice there's a lot of gens in this room that is not unusual. Um, <laughs> um, Jennifer Tuttle and I will uh, enter into a conversation with, with London. And then when that is complete, we will start taking questions uh, from the audience. You will notice that there is a Q&A. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box anytime during the reading. Um, and we will try to get through as many as possible. Um, in the meantime, I will be collecting names for a uh, two door prizes, which will be announced at the end of the event. And as you heard, Zoom announced to you that this is being recording and the recording will be stored on the Maine Women's Writers Collection webpage. No apostrophes. And, <laughs> um, you can Google that and find the uh, find the recording on there as well. And I think that's all. So now we are going to throw it over to London, who is going to begin um, our reading and conversation. All right. I am so excited to be here doing this at my alma mater, UNE. And I'm. it's great that uh, Jennifer Tuttle told a story of how we met. And she partly read from an email that I had found a printout of just recently. And I was like, oh, my God, I actually did what I set out to do, like the email is pretty solidly explains what I was going to do. And I did that and more, even more than I ever would have imagined. And then, um, and then to have uh, Jen O'Neill here too, um, who is a mentor to me when I was a scared beginner teacher. Um, it, it's just, 
it just feels so wonderful to have this combination of the School of Social Work and the Maine Women Writers Collection to be doing this. And also thank you to the people behind the scenes for everything that you've done and are doing to make this come off today. So um, uh, let's see. I am going to start. So I'm going to be reading a few different segments from various places in the book and then talking a little bit about them. And I'm going to start with the second and and the book is written in segments. And um, I'm going to say the title again because it really gives a sort of a summary of what the book's about because it's about a lot of things. But um, it's American Breakdown. Our Ailing Nation, My Body's Revolt, and the 19th Century Woman Who Brought Me Back to Life. And so I am going to read you the second and third segments first, uh, because originally the book started with the second segment um, until my editor got his hands on it. And I'm going to just talk a bit about that when I when I return there. So. I was 26 years old when I first laid eyes on the gold spine of Jean Strauss's Alice James a biography and pulled it down from the shelf. I'd heard about Alice. We had something in common. We'd both been felled by a mysterious fatigue. The book is fragile now. Its cover barely holds onto the spine. Oh, I brought it out. Here's the book. Um... And some of the pages are falling out, and most of them bear some kind of markings. Inside, I see the price, $2.50, still penciled inside the front cover. Someone else had owned the book before me. When I bought it, I took a purple pen to her name, crossed it out, and wrote my own in the year, 1994. I'd been sick for five years. I didn't know then that the book was treasure in my hands. It would become my company, my work, my healing. At the time, I was the living caretaker of a 1789 historic house museum in Maine, its substantial garden, perennial garden laid out in measured decorum inside a white picket fence. When I think now of that garden, I see it bursting in the violent bloom of high summer, stands of white liatris spiking the azure sky, gold rubecchia six feet tall and toppling, aphids on the helianthus, mold on the flocks, weeds overwhelming all the back beds. The garden was too much for me. From the bedroom window on the second floor, I could see the explosion of color, a carnival of red, yellow, purple, and pink. But I rarely looked down upon the garden from the bedroom window because what I saw more than anything, even from that vantage, was my failure to keep up. For me, the garden was something to be contended with. When I should have been weeding it, taming it, saving it from itself, instead, I lay in bed in the cool of the oscillating fan, reading about my dead bed comrade, Alice James. In Alice, I met my Victorian counterpart, my kindred spirit, and somehow reading about her, bright, witty, proud, and stuck, I began coming unstuck. Why was Alice sick? Why was I? From my bed and with the aid of interlibrary loan and a helpful librarian, whose name was Janice Beale, my hero, she not only got me going with my research, but she she let me know that Jennifer Tuttle was coming to town and that I should we should connect because of our similar interests. So Janice Beale is a hero. Um, and so are all research librarians, by the way. Um, anyway, with the aid of the inner, inner library alone and Janice Beale, the very helpful librarian, I set out on a journey to find some answers. I spent years researching American history, 19th century and contemporary toxicology biology, medical history, economics, environmental history, sociology, chaos theory, and more. And by the time I finished, things were a whole lot clearer. 99 years before I was born, Alice collapsed. She was 19 years old in 1868, two years younger than I would be when illness took me under. 
Her eldest brother, William, had just given up preparing for a career in medicine and was floundering toward his destiny as the father of American psychology. Henry, who would become one of America's most celebrated authors, had just seen his first story in print. Her brothers, Wilkie and Bob, were pursuing their own career opportunities three years after surviving Civil War combat. All her siblings suffered intermittently with mysterious pains and debilitations, but Alice from that point on spent most of her life in bed with nothing to commend her to posterity but a private diary she didn't even begin to write until many years later. Alice had fallen victim to a mysterious epidemic that was sweeping the country. Its symptoms were not fatal, but left sufferers in a state that sometimes felt closer to death than to life. The hallmark of the illness was an inexplicable, incapacitating fatigue that sent many, like Alice, to their beds. Almost no bodily system was spared. Victims endured headaches, insomnia, digestive problems, chronic pain, anxiety, inability to concentrate, and vertigo. They sank into dark depressions. Physicians were at a loss to produce an effective treatment. In 1869, Esteemed neurologist George Beard gave this diverse set of symptoms a name, neurasthenia. For 40 years, the illness wreaked havoc throughout the country. Then, as mysteriously as it arrived, it seemed to drop off the face of the planet. Or maybe it didn't. So those are um, the second and third segments of the book, where I really tried to lay out and give people an idea of sort of why I wrote wanted why I wrote the book um my connection to Alice James and why she's in it and um what they a, a little bit about what what readers can expect from the book but um I had a really wonderful editor who um helped me cut 14,000 words um, and he did it like in two weeks and it would have taken me a year to do that. I was so grateful. And he even gave me enough space. He gave, he cut more than needed to be cut so that I could sneak some back in. Um, but he had this idea and it's, um, the book is a blend of memoir and biography. That's me and Alice James and our illness stories. Um, but I also incorporate a lot of research. Um, and, um, to me, that's a way to engage both the head and the heart for a whole body experience. And I also felt like if I just did research, it would be, people wouldn't want to read it. It would be, just be too hard and too heavy and too heady. And um, so I really worked hard in the book to find a way to interweave memoir, the memoir and biography throughout with these um, facts to to make the story touch the head and the heart um, and make it a whole body experience. And um, Thomas was the name of my editor, Thomas Le Bien, and which means Thomas the Good in French. And he, um, he noticed that uh, one of the final segments, if not the final segment, will, um, ha has me swimming in it. And I also wrote about the me swimming in the middle of the book as like one of the ways I deal with stress and stress is one of the big subjects of the book. There are three there. Are, I really focused on um, chemicals in the domestic environment, um, stress in America. We have our own particular brand of stress because of our own particular brand of um, in, industrial capitalism. And then what's, what's not working for us in our medical system. So those are the three main things that I tackle in three different parts. And, um, but Thomas asked me, he suggested I put in an opening segment that has Alice swimming. And I, at first was like, I don't know from what I've read. I don't think they did a lot of swimming back in 1862. I don't think it got popularized for a little bit later. And I pushed back a bit. But Thomas loved the James family, loves the James family, and reread the um, Alice James biography in preparation for helping me with my book. And he was able to point me to the page where it says that Alice swam with her friends. So I'm going to read um, that short segment. 
which is now the beginning of the book. I imagine her in the summer of 1862, swimming with friends off the coast of Newport, all of them laughing and teasing, splashing around, showing off the things that young people did in the water in the mid-19th century and still do. They've swum out beyond the surf and the water is calm and warm. And for a moment, perhaps, Alice James feels free. She is 13 on the cusp of young womanhood and all its accompanying constraints. The water sparkles in the sunshine, rippling around her body. Does she swim the breaststroke to protect her hair? Does she float on her back and look up at the vast blue sky? Or does she dive down deep, eyes open, reveling in a world so different from the one above the surface? Looking back almost 30 years later, Alice wrote in her diary of that vanished girl, lamenting her, quote, blank, youthful mind, ignorant of catastrophe. And so what I just love that Thomas, my editor, um, made that suggestion. And what that segment allowed me to do was really sink into my imagination and sinking into my imagination. um allowed um, the less conscious part of me um, to guide how the book should start. Like the, the, my subconscious made some decisions about how the book should start. And um, for to me, the ripples that are around Alice that she's swimming in um, is an allusion to um, the ripples, the way the book itself ripples out as we go from the story of these two women, me and Alice, to these bigger and bigger stories about America itself. Because this book isn't just about Alice and me. This is a book that is relevant to anybody living in America. And particularly anybody who's concerned about staying healthy in America. Um, so now, for the second piece, I wanted to read... Um, something related to my um, social work uh, training. And I have to say that it wasn't until I started teaching social work, and in particular, I was teaching a foundational social work class called Human Behavior in the Social Environment, which for me, when I took it, was mind-blowing. Like, it changed. It was so exciting, and it changed the way I think about the world in a fundamental way. And so I wrote a segment about my first day of school at UNE. Um, it was on the ground. So it was before we, UNE was one of the first to have an online program, but it was, I, I was on the ground uh, learning in classrooms. And, um, and I'll also say this, yeah, so this book is about, this segment is about two things. I do write about my multiple chemical sensitivity, which I, you know, I introduced more earlier in the book. Um, and But it's also an encapsulation of the philosophical undergirding of the book. Um, and much of that comes from the mouth of Steve Rose, who is no longer with us, but he was on the faculty at UNE for probably a very long time. And, um, okay, I'm going to take a little drink. My years of therapy made me want to help people the way my therapist had helped me, so I enrolled in a master's in social work program. When I walked into the classroom that first day, the fragrances from people's shampoos, fabric softeners, body washes, and perfumes hung conspicuously in the air. Soon, I noticed the pressure building behind my eyes, and then the headache and the brain fog. I wanted to flee the room. But if I intended to become a social worker, I had to stay. Realizing I was going to have to say something, I gathered my thoughts for a minute. Then I raised my hand and spoke up. This is kind of hard to do on the first day of class, but I need to ask for your help. I have multiple chemical sensitivity, which means that scented products give me terrible headaches that aren't relieved by any painkiller. The chemicals in these products also make it hard for me to think clearly. 
I know it's a lot to ask, but if you could avoid wearing scented products as much as possible on the days you have class with me, that would be a big help. I was fortunate to be in a room full of aspiring social workers. If there's one thing this set wants to do, it's help. I saw expressions of compassion on the faces around me. And when I was finished, our professor, a tall bearded man who told us we could call him Steve, launched into his lecture. Far too often, he said, we pathologize the individual without considering contexts. But human behavior doesn't happen in a vacuum. In this class, we'll be looking at problems on a societal level that contribute to problems on an individual level. We'll explore how capitalism, which reduces people to, com to commodities with a specific economic value, causes disconnection, alienation, and fragmentation, and how this is the source of so many of the problems people face in society today. We'll also discuss the concept of normality as a form of social control. Social workers are generalists, he added, so it's important that we look at the whole picture when we consider our clients. That means the biological, the social, and the psychological. In other words, people are biopsychosocial beings. You'll be hearing that term a lot in your career as a social work student. I could see that I had a lot to learn. So, um, okay. So the next part I'm going to, I'm just going to tell you a little story about the next part. So, um, there are Jennifer Tuttle made it into the book. She um because she really helped me. We would go out for meals now and then, and I would tell her sort of the latest thing that I was struggling with or trying to figure out. And I was really trying to figure out like what could be the missing link that can help to connect health problems in the 19th century to the to um health problems now. And one day um, we met up at a coffee shop and she handed me this tiny little article. It was like this big from the Boston Globe. And it was, um, it was about arsenic in wallpapers in the 19th century. And it was particularly about arsenic in, um, the wallpapers of William Morris, who uh, you, some of you might be aware. I mean, he was just a huge figure in the arts and crafts movement and later a uh, socialist. Um, but at the time, at, at one point, they were using arsenic because it created this beautiful shields green, which is like a new color that was so exciting, particularly at this time in, of early industrialism when like the everything was getting gray and brown and trees were dying. And all of a sudden there was this beautiful vivid green that nobody had ever seen before um, that was made from arsenic. And um, I just, it just set off this passion in me. I got so excited digging around in research, finding, trying to find out more information. And I found out things like that arsenic, arsenical wallpapers um, covered maybe an average of 30% of the, um, of, what was it? Okay. I don't remember the st statistic, but it's in the book. It's either 30% of the, of the houses in Boston or they found that arsenic in the urine of 30% of people in a Boston study. So I'm sorry, I can't remember the specific fact, but it's in the book. And um, so there was arsenic and it was not just in wallpapers. It was in candy wrappers. It was used in bakeries in their, to line their drawers. It was in candles and playing cards. It was everywhere. And, um, and an industry you also, well, let me say, I'm going to, before I say that, and also, so, and one of the things that I did, and this is the, this is the piece that wound up in the anthology, the, the uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman anthology was I went to this story, the yellow wallpaper and explored how arsenical wallpaper, how Gilman may have been thinking either consciously or unconsciously, but is really pretty strong under, under thread of um something about arsenical wallpapers and that they were it was in the news there was people were concerned and industry was telling people they were just arseniophobic 
and it wasn't there were it, there were no health problems some of you might already be recognizing echoes for to what industry does today um and i'm going to read a little piece um two segments about the um, environmental protection agency this was another thing that was just shocking And so fun to research, even though it was awful. And then came the day in April 1988, when the Environmental Protection Agency deployed its environmental response team, a corps of specialists usually assigned to chemical spills and toxic waste dumps, to test the air in its own building. Five months earlier, the government agency charged with working for a cleaner, healthier environment for the American people, had begun renovating the poorly ventilated Waterside Mall. And as the renovations moved deeper and deeper into the maze-like passageways of the building, more and more people fell ill. Scientist Bobby Lively Diebold, who worked for the Superfund program, was one of them. She walked into her office one day and smelled a strong, acrid chemical odor Almost immediately, she later wrote, I began coughing and felt dizzy and nauseated. My breathing became labored and my lungs started to hurt. In addition, I was disoriented and lost my voice. I left the office and remained outside until my head was clear enough that I could drive home. Over 800 employees eventually suffered symptoms, including burning eyes and lungs, fatigue, cogn cognitive dysfunction, headaches, nausea, dizziness, and more. How did the EPA administration respond to the tide of health complaints by its very own scientists, lawyers, administrative assistants, and other employees? For a long time, it denied the problem and continued renovating. Lively Diebold was not far off the mark when she unfavorably compared the air at a Superfund site with the air at Waterside Mall. In a 1998 article in Scientific American, researchers Wayne Ott and John Roberts wrote that exposures to airborne toxicants at a Superfund site were negligible compared to those found in homes, cars, and offices. The chief sources, they wrote, appeared to be ordinary consumer products such as air fresheners and cleaning compounds and various building materials on offside is those are the exact kind of things that set off symptoms for people like me who have multiple chemical sensitivities. Even as far back as 1987, just four months before the Waterside Mall renovations began, a large scale EPA sponsored study about air quality came to, be, came to unexpected conclusions. People had always thought of pollution as an outdoor problem. They did not think of pollution as inhabiting their own homes. But the Total Exposure Assessment Methodology, or TEAM study, determined that even in the smoggiest areas of the country, indoor air pollution accounted for somewhere between 75 and 98% of total exposure to airborne toxicants, causing more cancer than smokestack emissions, water pollution, or toxic waste dumps. The teen study may have been the first to put the, to put the term sick building syndrome in writing. As a result of these studies, in 1988, Congress added an indoor air division to the EPA. But the EPA remained silent about the unhealthy air in its own building. And so now we, now we flip back to... Um, Alice James's time. So in Alice James's time, the New York City editors of the medical record wrote a facetious editorial accusing their, quote, interesting colleagues of Massachusetts of promulgating arseniophobia and irrational fear of arsenic. Many New York doctors viewed the arsenic scare as the latest Boston fad. Eventually, however, the dangers of arsenic in domestic products were generally acknowledged and gradually manufacturers removed the toxic element from their products. Now, big industry throws the word chemophobia around to discredit legitimate concerns about the dangers of synthetic chemicals. One nonprofit, 
that describes itself as a consumer education group, the American Council on Science and Health, even released a position paper called Scared to Death, How Chemophobia Threatens Public Health. The ACSH um, declares a mission declares a mission to, quote, add reason and balance to debates about public health issues and to bring common sense views to the public. But Mother Jones revealed in 2013 that the ACSH's donors and targeted potential donors comprise a who's who of energy, agriculture, cosmetics, food, soda, chemicals, pharmaceutical, chemical, pharmaceutical, and tobacco corporations. So that's who's behind the American Council on Science and Health, who say that their mission is to add reason and balance to debates about public health issues. Um, when we can't trust the corporations or the government to keep us safe, is it really irrational to be afraid? Okay, so now I'm just going to move into a little bit about uh, what I call the American way of stress. And this is just a like a thumbnail from a much larger part. In 1930, the economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that due to technological advances, people would be working as few as 15 hours a week by 2030. Now that we're inching closer to that date and working harder than ever, this prediction sounds absurd. The average productivity per American worker has increased 430 percent since 15, since 1950. 430 percent increase in the average productivity of American workers since 1950, which means that in fact we should be able to afford the same standard of living as a 1950 worker by working 10 hours a week. Wouldn't that be awesome? But wages haven't kept up with productivity. If the median hourly compensation had kept pace with the productivity since 1979, the median worker would now be earning $9 more per hour or about $19,000 more per year. Americans are now busier than ever, working more and vacationing less than any other industrialized country, all while we get less in unemployment, disability, retirement benefits, and retire later than people in similarly wealthy countries. In a 2018 Gallup poll, 55% of American adults said that on the previous day, they had experienced stress a lot of the day. This figure was 20% higher than the global average. All of this job-related stress is estimated to cost American companies more than $300 billion a year in health costs, absenteeism, and poor performance. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health found that healthcare expenditures are nearly 50% greater, that's 5-0, for workers who report high levels of stress. Unsurprisingly, when workers are healthy and enjoying their lives, they actually perform better. Okay, and so to, so no reading from American Brain Breakdown is complete without giving you the opportunity to hear something in Alice's own voice. So um, that's what I'm going to end with is just a short segment. <clears throat> Toward the end of her life, Alice despaired of finding a doctor who could both hear her and cure her. As she wrote to William, It may seem supine to you that I don't descend into the medical arena, but I must confess my spirit quails before any more gladiatorial encounters. It requires the strength of a horse to survive the fatigue of waiting hour after hour for the great man, and then the fierce struggle to recover one's self-respect. I think the difficulty is my inability to assume the receptive attitude, that cardinal virtue in women, the absence of which has always made me so uncharming to and uncharmed by the male sex. But through it all, she never gave up her self-respect. When William 
wrote her a pitying letter around that time that included his perception of her, quote, stifling slowly in a quagmire of disgust and pain and impotence, she parried by informing her that she and her friend Catherine had roared over his letter. And here's the quote, for I consider myself one of the most potent creatures of my time. She threw in a dig at her professor brother, though I may not have a group of Harvard students sitting at my feet drinking in psychic truth, I shall not tremble, I assure you, at the last trump. Nor did she. And so that's all I'm going to read, but I'm just going to say, like, I have goosebumps. So I still laugh out loud when I read quotes from Alice that I have, that are in my book that I have read over and over again. This quote gives, I mean, when she... When she wrote that she considers herself um, one of the most potent creations of her time, even though she'd been this woman who'd been bedridden and ill and trapped in her body and unable to sort of be a, the a more productive woman in society, she still had this ferocity about her and and such wit, as you can tell, and such smarts. So that's why she became my kindred spirit and how she sort of guided me towards um, this life that I have spent for 20 plus years researching and writing this book, American Breakdown. Thank you so much, London. That was really, really lovely. Um, and I so appreciate you, you know, coming and and sharing that with us and uh, really giving us all a flavor of what is in, you know, in the story, in this narrative. I do love how you have woven so many things into the narrative that includes you and um Alice, correct? For some reason, her name just—it's been a, a long teaching day. That's, that's so fine. Yes, her it's name Alice. right out of my head. Alice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm I'm going to start off with a, a question that um, I think I know the answer to, but I, I I think it's 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 kind of where my interests lie when I hear stories like this. Um, how difficult or not difficult um, was it, and was it always your plan to kind of weave a kind of an anti-capitalism narrative into this larger story. Anyone who is in this room who knows me, Lacey and Aaron and Kelly. I'm <laughs> not mentioning know, any names. They are not going to be surprised that that was my question. <laughs> Thank you. I love that question. And because, you know, when I was fumbling around in the early days of writing the book and, you know, researching things like arsenic and wallpapers and researching more about Alice's life and life in the 19th century, and, you know, comparing that to my own experience and what I know of this culture, I didn't actually have like that under theme yet. And it was really a separate meal with Jennifer Tuttle, where um, I know, like, I don't even know would I ever figured it out. Like, she was the one who put the pieces together. I, I said to her, but wasn't the 19th century a cleaner and purer time? So, like... I actually thought that, you know, I, I wasn't really aware of how much problem they had with air quality and water quality from mills and factories. And um, so Jennifer gently corrected me on that. And then I think she started using, I don't, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you started using the phrase industrialism or industrial capitalism. And that's sort of, that was like the little bell that helped me see this un this uh I, I can't think of a good term, but it's like the thing that's at the core of all the interweaving. And it and it, like I wasn't even halfway through the book when that came to me. So so at that point I could start sort of researching and thinking more in that way. But also Steve Rose helped me think about things in terms of in, of um, capitalism and how it affects us as humans. And so, and, and not just Steve Rose, I mean, just the whole social work program 
instead of, I mean, I think one of the things that anybody with a chronic illness and particularly a um, quote mysterious chronic illness, which I would call a complex multi-system illness that hasn't been properly researched by science because it primarily strikes women. Um, any of us who have those kinds of illnesses, we feel we are we are sort of given a lot of shame. It's like handed over to us because the problem isn't it's us. It's in our heads. We're imagining things because we have some. Uh, we might get some benefit from the sick role or um, maybe we're just depressed or we're just anxious. And we, you know, people I know have been like given anti-anxiety meds or antidepressants to treat this illness, which sometimes that can be helpful to treat some of the symptoms of these illnesses, but it doesn't get to the core of the problem. And sometimes the attitudes of the providers passing those meds out is like, you know, as my first doctor said to me when I was first, she wasn't my first doctor. My first doctor was a really, really lovely pediatrician. I had my entire childhood, which most kids don't get to have the good fortune of having anymore. But um, the doctor I first got when I moved here to Maine and fell ill after just a few months, um, finally, she always seemed felt impatient with me and I didn't know for sure if I was imagining it or not until the day she told me that I was just depressed and um, the best thing for me would be to get back to work and um, and therefore she was going to refuse to sign a form that would um, relieve me of having to do work fair in ex to, to sort of relieve me of having to do work in exchange for welfare benefits which I had to be on because I couldn't work so I've gone off and then to come back to the question, I don't even remember where I, 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 uh, <laughs> I don't remember where, where I was. I can't remember how, how to tie that back into your question. Jen. Well, you did tie it back into my question. Okay. I, I was curious, like, at, you know, at what point did capitalism become a part of the narrative? Was it like that from the beginning? Yeah. Or did you kind of come upon it? And it sounds like, although you had this social work perspective on capitalism, that it didn't really become a part of this particular narrative until there was a, a clarifying conversation with Jennifer Tuttle, <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah. And then you already had the background of social work, so that kind of wove it all in together. Because I, I love that it's a part of it because I think it's a really important part of the overall kind of story. So Yeah, and I think, I think yeah, the last piece I now I remember that I wanted to say to tie, to tie it up is that... Um, when I stopped taking on the shame that um, healthcare providers, researchers, and the government were sending the way of people like me with my illness and others like it, that was when I began to see the idea of um, the personal is political as a uh, a really empowering way to change the narrative about my experience. So I stopped feeling the shame and blame when I was able to start looking outwards at what were the societal things that were contributing to my problem. And like not only the poor research and the poor health care, but also the, the, the amount of stress that I was under when I moved here to try to make enough money to pay the rent to find a job that would pay enough money to pay the rent, you know, and all of us are scrambling now to make enough money, which, and that's part of what I read about. Like, it's not your imagination. We are working much, much harder for much, much less. And our high point was about 1973. Yeah. It's, 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 it's part of the story that they want us to believe that we we're just not working hard enough. Yes. That's you the know? story they want us to believe. Right. We're not and, working, a, and it's our fault if yes. we don't have enough money. Right. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, uh, as a friend of mine, too. as a friend of mine <laughs> likes to say, you know, this pull yourself up by your bootstrap narrative, it assumes that people have boots and bootstraps. Yes. Right. Nicely said. Right. Which <laughs> is not always the case. So. Yeah. All right. I will stop my anti-capitalism. It's rant. great talking with a social <laughs> worker about this stuff. <laughs> And allow Jennifer Tuttle to. Uh... Okay. Wow. Well, that was so interesting because um, 
I do think, I mean, London, you're such a muckraker. I love that about your work. And I love that you're always thinking about the, you know, systemic and structural forces that shape individual lives. And I found that really um, important and valuable. I always have. Um, So I guess I have so many questions for you, but one of the things that I was thinking about as, you know, a literary critic and an English teacher um, is genre. And one of the things that I find really um, meaningful is to think about this book as a patient narrative. It is many things, of course, which is an, uh, somewhere I heard you say that that's your superpower, right? <laughs> Braiding all of these narratives together. And that right. is so true. Um, and that's part of it being a patient narrative. But anyway, uh, so one of the things that as I read your book and reread your book, and as I've talked to you about your book, one of the things I've always been thinking about is this sort of, um, you know, struggle of someone in the patient role like yourself with sort of some of the things that you've alluded to, right? Um, Being denied authority, being denied control over their narrative, right? And I also, and so I'd love to hear you talk more about that, but, and specifically in relation to, you know, how that fueled your writing of this book, because of course it is about society. It is about history. It is about economics, but it's also about you and your experience. Um, And you may or may not want to weave this in, but I also was thinking about, you know, one of the things I've, I really enjoyed about the book, even though it was harrowing was you talking about that first doctor in Maine and how your experience with that doctor, in fact, partially led you to want to write your own book. Yeah. And I guess I'm just wondering if you want to comment on any of those things, what you want to say about that. Yeah. I like to say that that doctor was the fire under my ass to keep going for 20 whatever years. So, I mean, there is a place for anger um, in energizing us to move to activism. And for me, writing this book was a way to reclaim my voice. And, you know, when you read the book, I think it might be evident that I um, there were ways that I wasn't allowed to have a voice as a kid either. Um, and, like, that's the truth. That's true for many uh, girls and maybe especially Canadians because Canadians are, like, told to be very humble and polite. And also I, um, I come from Lutheran Norwegian stock, which is also very humble and... Quiet. And so, like, the, the full power of me was not allowed to be. Um, so, in some ways, I mean, that experience with that doctor was a trauma. I mean, my the illness was a trauma. The most traumatic thing that ever happened to me, m- much more so than my parents' divorce when I was 11. Um, and But my doctor, th- to have a doctor who was dismissive and who I could feel was dismissive... But I couldn't even, like, accuse her of it until I got the final thing. And then, of course, that was the last time I went to see that doctor. And I um, I would never, like, I learned a lesson there. Like, I don't, I think I went to see her, like, four or six times. It's like, how, why would I keep going back to somebody who made me feel that way? Please, people, don't do that. If you have a doctor that makes you feel like crap, find another doctor. If you can. I know it's, I live, I mean, it's a luxury for me. I live in a city, um... And doctors are harder and harder to come by for all of us, but we shouldn't have to put up with that crap. And there are some really good and wonderful doctors. And so that other piece, I think, and you can, I'm going to say it, and then you can maybe, I think you, you, there was more. Was Taking control of your narrative. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I, there's a, there's a place in the book where I write um, about some of the things I learned about narrative as I was researching and it came from oh brain come on he wrote um arthur frank yes thank you thank you alternate brain jennifer tuttle (laughs) (laughs) and the book is probably the uh, wounded healer which is like the most amazing name because 
you know, there's a lot of pressure on people like therapists and doctors to be perfect, but we're all wounded and the wound actually makes us human and helps us connect. And, um, but um, he talks about, so Arthur Frank talks about the different kinds of narratives that people who um, are ill, uh, um, can, fall ill, um, can slip into. And one is the, um, I'm doing this all from my head instead of from notes, but one is, um, I can't remember what he calls it, but it's like the, it's the one where the, it's like the most simple narrative where like the doctor, it's like a curative narrative. That's not the term, but where the doctor, like the client, the patient gets sick, the doctor gives a medicine and the patient gets better. That's one kind of narrative. When you have an illness like mine, you don't get to have that kind of narrative. And, and to tell you the truth, doctors don't really like that. It's frustrating. Most, some doctors, for whatever reason, will specialize in it, but it's hard because it doesn't, we don't have enough answers yet for doctors to get that feeling of achievement of helping somebody, right? But there are more ways to help people than just helping them get better, even just listening to their story. And so the other kind of story that Arthur Frank talks about is the chaos narrative. And the chaos narrative, I would say that I was in that for probably a decade, um, maybe more, um, probably sort of meeting Alice in the pages of the Jean Strauss biography helped that might have been like the first toehold out of the chaos narrative. Like, why is this happening to me? You know, and how do I get out of it? And my whole life just fell out of control because it was. Um, and but having that Alice's narrative to take to cling to, and then a few years later when I had the had graduated and had the time to be able to dig begin like focusing my energy on that. And then the final one that he talks about is the quest narrative. And so I I believe that American Breakdown is a quest narrative. And I believe that my, like, reading Alice James's biography is what set me on that quest to, like, find out the bigger story about what was happening to me personally. And when we can, when we can take our own individual narrative and look at it contextually and among, with, with the company of others, um, it changes, it turns the table of power. And that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to make sure that um, I wrote a book that was uh, credible and well-researched. So um, it looks thicker than it is because a lot of those pages are endnotes for the more skeptical people who want to see that I use actual verified research valid research um and um and once again i've gone off <laughs> no it's great no i love because there's so much in this book and um you know uh everything's interlocking so it's all, yes. i imagine it's really hard to answer a question without talking about everything else at the same time right <laughs> yeah it is and one of the things i found as i've started doing these talks is realizing oh I'm not a linear thinker, like obviously from the book, right? And that used to be a detriment. Like I, when I started, when I started studying literature, I, I was, um, my minor was in English when I first started straight out of high school at the University of Windsor in Canada. My, my no, my major was English. My minor was creative writing, but you didn't, creative nonfiction wasn't even an option. It was either fiction or poetry. And when I tried to write fiction, I couldn't, write a linear narrative. It always felt like I couldn't do it. It was my failure. Um, and then creative nonfiction came out, you know, became a thing. It was, it was here before, but it became, it got a name. It became a thing. Um, it's a studied thing. It's like, it's sort of doing all kinds of interesting things. I particularly love um, lyric essays that do something like what I'm doing in the book of interweaving things without necessarily having like an obvious linear here, then here, then here. And um, yeah, that's how my mind works. So it used to be, I used to feel like it was a weakness, but yeah, now I feel like it's my superpower. But when it comes to speaking in public, it can take me off and I know how to come back, but my memory doesn't always remind, help me like remember what the thing was to get me there. I think a lot of us can relate. Yeah. <laughs> especially those of us of a certain age. And didn't we all realize that, that us three Jennifers were all born the same year? 
Yes, I think have. that is true. Yes. Well, it was a big, it was a big name in our year, yes, which is it very was. popular with the name, right? Um, so I think I'd like to take us into the, some audience Q and A, if, if we're all agreeable to that, we have some yes. some great questions. So I'm going to take the first one. It's from KS and it says, wow, such inspiring work. Thinking about the yellow wallpaper, which I was thinking about through your whole talk, which is such a social work assignment, correct? <laughs> um, and the rich history you uncover. Can you share a bit about how your gender and the gender of these women impacted your journey? I mean, it sounds yes. like it was your journey. <laughs> yes, but you know, you're. But that's a great question because I mean, I get a little bit goosebumpy. It's a sisterhood, yeah. right? And yeah. um, it's a sisterhood, and to be able to frame, sort of have a framework for for the book, which isn't the framework. I don't have just one framework. I have probably several. One is industrial capitalism, but another is feminism. And like, let's look at this critically about, you know, and let's take into consideration the way that women have been treated. And if we'd had more time, I had other segments that I had to cut about Freud and all kinds of, you know, the whole idea of hysteria, where that came from. It's in the book. It's in the book. Okay. Um, Jennifer Tuttle, would you like to take the next question? Sure. I'm so glad. There's so many great questions here. Um, I am gonna, I'm gonna focus on uh, Lori Fears' question because uh, there was a question I really wanted to make sure we got to today, and uh, Lori addresses this question. Um, so I'm gonna preface it by saying, you know, I know that um, this is a really, I mean, this is a book that is dealing with. Well, the title is breakdown. Yeah. Right. It's dealing with really um, weighty, heavy uh, things. And it's narrating not only your own personal crisis, but as uh, you say at one point, right, your illness is actually about us as a society. Yeah. Right. So. So, yes, there's that. But one of the things that I think is really brilliant that you really anticipate is readers are going to want to know what Lori's asking. Um, you know, um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to read Lori's question without giving away the end of the book. What do you suggest each of us do to push back against the evils of capitalism? In other words, how can we individually and collectively change America? Um, and maybe that would be a place though, to ask you, can you talk about why you added the appendix and what, yes, and, thank and you, what that's doing? Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Laurie, for those questions. And um, yeah, so when I was writing the book, I mean, I was very conscious the whole time I was writing it that I didn't want it to be just a heavy book that people would put down. I wanted to write a book that um, appealed to people's minds and their hearts. And that's why the memoir and the biography are in there. And um, and then, the, um, but I also knew I feel like a lot of books will tell us what's wrong, but they don't give us any. Then you put down the book and then it's over. And I felt like I can't do that. Like things we are in too desperate of times to be just telling people the bad news and not and leaving them disempowered. And so um, I the final part that I wrote was I knew I needed to write something hopeful. And I was writing the book. I was writing I had I didn't know what it would be. And it was like it was during the Trump presidency that I had to write something hopeful. And um, <clears throat> finally, I got to the day where it's like, OK, well, now I have to, like, come up with something. And I had written I had read a book by Rebecca Solnit called Hope in the Dark, which is like the best title, like for any of us who are desperate. Hope in the Dark is ex so exactly right on. And she that did an amazing job of helping me change my thinking about how social change happens. And so I think what happens for a lot of us is like, um, we either feel um, pessimistic and we just think it's hopeless. We can't do anything. So why bother? Which is exactly what the powers that be want us to feel because it keeps us powerless and it keeps us quiet. Or, um, 
or we're so hopeful that everything's going to work itself out. And this is from, from Solnit that we say, yeah, this is just going to work itself out. So I don't have to do anything. And neither of those things is accurate. And it is not over. Things feel really dark right now. There's a lot of bad stuff going on, but it's not over. And so we have a choice, right? Like we can just all give up and let our children and grandchildren um, sort of live with the consequences of our inaction, or we can take action. And the problem is we're all so overworked and exhausted by this capitalist system. This It's like overly capitalist system, this like capitalism on steroids system that um, it's hard for us to make more time for activism. I feel like if each of us just like did a notch more, we could create tremendous change. And um, the other piece that I learned from Solent, Solent that I think is so important is that for those of us who have worked on or do work on some, some uh, social change thing that we want to have happen, um, when it doesn't happen, if we're like trying to get a new law passed or whatever, we feel like we failed and you see we are powerless, but that's not actually the truth. Like if we think about some of the long games and the ones I was thinking about, the ones that came to me, um, one is gay marriage. Like people were fighting for the right to marry, um, for the right to same sex, same sex marriage since at least Stonewall, which was, I think, the 50s. And um, so, but all those people for all those decades who are fighting for the right to marry the people they loved, when they didn't get what they wanted, it didn't mean that they were failing. It meant that they were building the groundwork and um, they were loosening the lid. They were creating, they were building the foundation and they gave it to us through their labor. and. Um, then suddenly, it seemed sudden, all of a sudden, gay marriage is like passing in Maine and other states. And then all of a sudden, the president, Obama, made it federal. This thing that had been like simmering under the surface and had failed over and over again, including in Maine, all of a sudden. And Black Lives Matter seems like it was all of a sudden. But the other thing that um, that uh, Solnit says is that social change happens first in the minds and hearts. Right. So actually, social change starts first with story. And so um, it might feel powerless to tell your story, to write a letter to the editor. Um, it might feel like it's not doing anything, but all those stories um, help to change people. And um, the black uh, another one was um, uh, me, too. I tell you what, I actually haven't had uh, that kind of the kind of sexual assault experience that so many women were describing in Me Too. I mean, I'm still oppressed by that culture, as we all as all women are by rape culture. But I could not believe when I was the stories after story after story and all those stories changed our culture and created changes that we didn't think we would see happen. And I'm not saying that it made it perfect and I'm not saying Black Lives Matter made it happen. It made it perfect, but it created something. And I'll say one last thing on this question, which is, no, two more things. One is um, that one of the questions I had to ask students in one of my HBSE classes, I can't remember which school, but Jen, you'll know, was did, um, um, uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street accomplish anything? And students, a lot of students were like, no, they didn't have like concrete goals. It didn't accomplish anything. And I thought about that question. And I thought when I started writing, researching my book in 2001 and writing it in 2007, I purposely planned to never use the word capitalism because that word turned people off. And when people thought of capitalism, they immediately thought of socialism, which they immediately thought of capitalism, of co communism. Socialism is not communism. I go into that in the book. And um, there's such a thing as democratic socialism. We can have a democracy and we can have more socialist policies. And um, so I, so, so uh, to me, Occupy Wall Street changed the story and allow like, all of a sudden, I wasn't even aware of it, 
But all of a sudden, I was feeling fully free to use the word capitalism in my book and talk about it openly. And we as a culture are talking about it far more than we were before we Occupy Wall Street. So yay to those folks, because they did amazing work. And then the only other one, thing I want to say in response to uh, Lori's question is, I can't answer specifically, but I did also give like a list of 10 action things as ideas for people to think about, like, what can you do? Because activism isn't just marching in the streets. That's one kind of activism. It's an important kind of activism. Um, but there are other things that we can do um, instead or in addition. Simple things like writing a letter to the editor. Um, but it's in the book. So, and because I can't remember any others. <laughs> Because Jennifer Tuttle asks specifically about the appendix, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, the appendix is a list of actions um, that that London was just referring to. And it really does run the game. I got up and got my book so I could comment on it. Thank you. Uh, um, it really does run the gamut. Like you will find something here that is something that you are, you know, that, that you want to be a part of. So I really right. highly recommend. And before we get to the next question, I just want to do a quick plug here. Um, please visit London's website. It is in the chat, jenniferlondon.com. The book is available in uh, many places, the UNE bookstore, amazon.com, your local bookstore. If they don't have it, you can order it. Um, so if you, if you haven't purchased it yet, we really you know, would uh, we would hope that after hearing all this great information about how the book came to be, would would pique your interest. Um, and London, I am going to tell you this. I haven't. There's a couple of people on the call from this, but I am going to buy a, one of these books for all of our faculty, Ooh, so that they you. can. Wow! Thank you. Yeah. So that they, I've had several of my faculty say I'm really interested in reading this. So we are going to purchase the school of social work is going to purchase books for all the faculty. Um, so that they have it and they can have it on their bookshelf and they can read it. So I feel like I'm in the Oprah, the Oprah <laughs> one where she gave a card to everybody. A book, and you get a book and you get a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, okay. So we've got a couple more questions. So feel oh, wait, free. Before you do that, I need to make a correction. I do not believe that UNE bookstores is, uh, has the oh, book. Okay. They are not adding it. Okay. Sorry. No. I thought we had got that done. And also I just want to make sure is the meeting chat, Oh, can people see that? Or is, I think that might just be us behind us. No, I, I did a behind okay. the scenes with Lee and. Okay. You know, out. you know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, we, we do have time for a couple more questions. So if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the Q and a, so this is from an anonymous participant. Um, I have stage four endometriosis and I definitely connect with the part about personal becoming political. It is sad to see that the healthcare system has failed this time and time again. It is so important that you spoke up and reclaimed your voice. It is so helpful for so many young women like me. Thank you for sharing. Oh, I was, I thought that was a question. But I a question. Thank you. Thank you. Anonymous participant. And I just want to say that, um, although I do not have endometriosis and I'm sorry that you do, cause I know how painful it is and how long it takes to get a diagnosis i don't even know why it's so hard um that's i actually do talk a little bit about endometriosis in the book because there's one theory that alice james might have suffered from it among and she might also have an autoimmune disease you know she might have had what we call chronic fatigue syndrome now mm -hmm. but um i just wanted to say that okay um and i love this next question um what do you this is from beth DeWolf. Um, who do you like to read for pleasure, fiction or nonfiction? And do you read one book at a time or multiple books at once? Oh, my God. I love that, that question. almost tempts me to open the curtain because you would see behind me piles and piles of books on the bed where I often write and research. Uh, but it's too, I can't, it's too personal. But I need to step behind the curtain because there are two books that I want to, um, I want to, I want to say, and I can keep talking while I'm behind the curtain. <laughs> I know you're never supposed to do this when you're on stage. I'm actually climbing up on the pile of bed to get the two books that I want to mention. Because, so my next book, this is relevant. My next book is going to be very different. Um, I'm going to write about the river where I swim. So the river is mentioned in the book. Because swimming is like my healing thing. And that spot in the presumpscate where I swim 
is healing on so many levels, not just because swimming feels good and is good for my health and my mental health, but also because of the animals and the nature and also even the people that I meet with there that I just bump into. And I'm, I'm an introvert, but at the river, I say hi to people and talk with them. <laughs> um, so it's going to think of it as being like a very s- more simple book, more, much more memoir based, a little bit of research, but not a lot. And I asked my agent, like, what's the shortest book I can write and it still be a book? And she's like, I don't know, maybe 45,000 pages, which is about half what American Breakdown. Is. I don't uh, or 45,000 words, not pages. <laughs> um, so that's my goal. We'll see how I do. But in service of that book, you know, writing that book, writing the river book is a way for me to heal from the hard work of writing American Breakdown, facing all the things that I was reading in American Breakdown. I mean, for me, it was fiery. It fired me up, but it's also hard work. The hard work of being a licensed clinical social worker, doing therapy with people, um, the hard work for any of us living in this country during these times is just hard and heavy for us. And so uh, writing a book about the place that brings me the most joy and happiness and sort of brings me back to my child nature girl self, um, I can't wait to start. I've got like lots of notes, but I haven't, I don't quite know how, what it's going to look like, which is exciting. But in service of that, I, um, do you all remember scholastic books when you could like just order, you could just like, you were in grade school and they would, um, you could, there was like a little catalog and you could pick what books. And if if you were lucky, you know, your parent, who, whatever, how many books your parents would let you have. I think mine let me have like two. And, um, but this time it was like scholastic books, but for me. And so I had made a long list of b- books related to the book I wanted to write about the river. Part of some of those lists I got from people on Facebook when I posted about it. Um, and then I like ordered a whole bunch of them all at once. Um, a few months after the book came out, a couple months when I thought, okay, I'm in the clear, I might have some time. Then I got a puppy and there was no time, but I, I do read a little bit and I pulled out two of the ones that I'm really loving. So first in answer to your question, Beth, I almost pri- almost solely read nonfiction. I just love nonfiction. Um, and I read some poetry and I do read novels on occasion, but just not very often. Um, but these two books are blowing me away. Small Bodies of Water by Nina Minya Poles. Uh, Poles is P-O-W-L-E-S. Small Bodies of Water. She lives in New Zealand. Her book is written in short segments, sort of the way mine is, except hers is about nature and about swimming. And But it's she does the same sort of interweaving thing um, that I like to do and I love to read. Um, so she's one and it's just so peaceful to read that. And the other one, I had never heard of Barbara Hurd, H-U-R-D. Somebody on Facebook recommended her work. This book is called Listening to the Savage, River Notes and Half Heard Medicine. No, sorry. River Notes and Half Heard Melodies. Is it weird that I'm upside down? (laughs) Sorry. River notes and half heard melodies. And it's so just lyrical and so calming. And um, I'm just going to, out of the blue, I'm just going to read one sentence and then I'll be done with my book recommendations. I mean, I could recommend books all day, but every toad hungry predator. Oh yeah. Every toad hungry predator around knows that rain means that food is about to climb right out of the earth, manna from below, and it's ready, its eyes tracking movement, its nose catching whiffs. And that just brings me back to the earth. And I think we all need to come back to the earth in order to feel more grounded in and connected in these difficult times. I agree a hundred percent. Um, so we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. So I really encourage if you do have one, now's the time to put it in. We'd love to answer mm-hmm. it for you. Um, but while I have you, London, I wanted to ask you one more question. I wanted to ask you at what point in your kind of journey with this chronic illness that, you know, did not have a diagnosis for, you know, a very long time began, you know, I'm assuming 
with the chemical sensitivity and everything. At what point in that journey did, did your brain go, I have to write a book about this. I need to put this on paper. I need other people to read it. I, I think there's something here that uh, other folks will recognize and be able to get something from. Yeah. I'll say that I was a writer. I mean, I took writing pretty seriously in high school and um, you know, my minor was in, in creative writing for my first two years of college. And then I left, I left the university of Windsor and moved here to Maine to start my adult life. And then my adult life got stymied by um, a case of mono that turned into chronic fatigue syndrome and then multiple chemical sensitivity. But um, so I had always wanted to write a book, but for uh, the falling as ill as I did and being as depressed as I was at that time, just made like I just stopped writing I couldn't I had nothing and so finding that biography of Alice was like this first little glimmer of because I just got so curious as I said before about the similar the possible similarities between our two illnesses and this feeling that I'd met a soul sister from a century before um and that I was curious about and wanted to research so I, I got the idea that I wanted to write a book about about Alice and me when I read the book in 1996, but I was still finishing up my schooling. And so didn't start reaching, researching until 2001. Um, and I think, too, because of the anger that I had for how these illnesses are dismissed, um, I knew that I wanted to do more than just explore how how our illnesses may or may not be similar because I had something to say. <laughs> and I I'd read a lot of stuff. Like I knew I knew I knew some things that I thought people needed to read. So I think that's my answer. If I could jump in, um I I love that answer. I think that really is um, just so simple and straightforward and clear. Uh, so then my question piggybacks on that, which is, okay, you are determined to write this book and you're ill, right? And you're busy and you're trying to keep a roof over your head. And so what strategies did you use as a writer to make it happen? Thank you. That's, that's a good question. And um, yeah, there was a part when I was starting to try to write the book. Um, and I, for a while I thought I would, I would be writing uh, sort of, uh, I think it's called meta um, where I was ex also exploring my struggles to write the book within the book. Um, and I ended up not doing that. But there, there were points where I was just too exhausted. Like, I'm pretty driven as a human. And I dreamed of writing, a, publishing a book since I was a little kid. And so that drives a lot, too. And um, as I said, like, wanting to get a message out after the humiliating isn't the right word. I Dehumanizing uh, experience with my doctor um was was a fire but um i really had to i really grappled with and had to learn like it was very hard those days when i was fatigued like should i push and keep writing or should i take a break and i don't even know that there's a right answer i think i mean one of the things my illness has taught me is it's really important to listen to our bodies and to rest when we need rest and it's very very hard for americans to do that probably other countries some other countries too some countries do that better than others far better <laughs> than we do but um but the other piece for me that i think is really unfortunate uh, uh really important and and I think it's important to for people to hear is that I've always been pretty confident in myself as a writer, and that doesn't come out of nowhere. That comes out of the support that I got from my teachers and my parents. Starting in grade school, 
when I was in sixth grade, my friends and I decided we wanted to write a novel. And our fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Hardy, who is now one of my Facebook friends, she was like one of the best teachers. She like started a club for us. So she helped us do that, right? Teachers are so important. And then, and my parents always supported me. They did when I, there was a, my best friend's grandfather was a Canadian writer who's like every Canadian knows, or at least did when I was young, uh, W.O. Mitchell. Um, he wrote like sort of a foundational uh, coming of age story called Who Has Seen the Wind? And so I grew up sort of having an awareness of the fact that writers exist and they have lives. And I remember one day I was driving home from my parents were driving me home from Sarah's house. And I said, I want to be a, I decided I want to be a writer when I grow up. And my parents, they were very supportive of my writing, but they also said, you might want to keep in mind that you're going to have to have a second job. That's why I became a social worker. <laughs> Um, and, oh, I don't want to lose my train of thought again, because I'm thinking about, um, pull me back in. What was I saying? Wanted to be a writer, social worker. Oh, this is, okay. So then we go to high school. I had a, a teacher in high school and a peer. They would read every one of my poems and give me feedback. And then that was Mrs. Sterling. And then Mr. Quarry, I had him for two years. He was my English teacher. He was an amazing teacher. He's much loved to this day. And he, I went to him. He gave, I gave him everything that I wrote, every poem I wrote. And he was the one who taught me um, show, don't tell, which is an important rule. But I've also learned that it's important to also be able to break that, especially as an essayist. But he really taught me about clean writing and, um, you know, not putting too many emotional things in in certain ways. I don't know. I just learned so much from him. I actually secretly sent him a copy and he was so happy. And he's in the he's in the acknowledgments. Um, and, you know, I sent to contests when I was a kid and got some, you know, finalist or whatever in like a kid's magazine called people and pets or I don't even know it was like just a small little thing you know and winning little contests in high school all that stuff builds a person's confidence up and I um I believe you if you're going to be a writer you have to be able to uh find a way to manage rejection because you're going to be rejected far more often than you're going to be accepted and if you don't have confidence in your work which may or may not be because the work isn't good, but you know, it's like you, you have to have, like have for me, having confidence in my abilities as a writer has just helped me just bounce back and help me keep going. It's like, okay, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to spend 20 years on it. I want to get it published by an imprint of one of the big five. That's my goal. I'll go with something else if I can't do that. And I'm just going to invest 20 years on the gamble that somebody's going to publish it. How do you do that? You do it because you're like confident. <laughs> and how, where do you get that? You get that from the people in your life. And there's another social worky relational thing to say. It's like, so I just want the parents and the teachers to know how important your work supporting your children as creators or athletes or anything else is in them feeling confident to, to push through and keep going. That's my answer. <laughs> it's an excellent, excellent answer, London. Um, all right. Well, it's 729, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, first, before people start to sign off, I want to announce who the door prize winners. I put everybody's name into a random picker and let them pick. So the two winners are Betty McLeod and Laurie Fair, who asked one of the questions. So... Um, the two winners can email me at J O'Neill. So it's J O N E I L, the number four at UNE.edu. Um, you can also find me on the UNE School Social Work webpage. And, and also, they both know me. So if you really get lost, you okay. can reach out to me and then I can get okay. it. We can figure and it out. We will send you um, two co a copy each of that book. And. Um, Jennifer Tuttle, do you have any wrap up that you want to to do? Sure, thank you. I just want to say, first of all, thank you everyone for attending. It is so meaningful to us. I really want to celebrate London and her book. Uh, London said that social change starts with story. 
And this book is a shining example of that. So yeah. um, we hope that everyone will go out and buy it, give it to your friends, read it, talk about it, and then go go uh, intervene in your own idiom. So thank you very much. And congratulations, London. Thank yes, you. London. Congratulations. Oh, so much. Great. I'm going to sign off. Good night, yes. everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.